no, folks, your your vision is fine. We're actually <laughs> together. How are we doing, man? <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, first off, I want to apologize. Um, I know you've given me the invite to be on the show several yeah. times, and, and uh, you are my inspiration <laughs> for what I do. Uh, I've been a huge fan. I love your rods. Uh, I love your dock shooting technique, and you have been a true inspiration to me for a long, long time. I said there, there's been a lot of people uh, that have helped me out in my career. Uh, you know, that they've done shows. I mean, yeah. Ronnie Caps uh, had crappie time, and I always idolized him. Carl Kalanka in, in Canada always did a great yeah, uh, yeah. show with crappie, and and then Russ Bailey. I mean, <laughs> you, you guys are truly the spearheads of great crappie production, and and man, I I aspire to be like you. That's because we're old, is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, well, yeah, everyone's grow old, but. Uh, <laughs> So, folks, if you can't tell, I'm with Crappie Kirby. Uh, this is a time for a new Brush Pile podcast, and uh, we're here at the Grizzly Show. We finally found a room we could get into. Uh, yeah, it's we, been crazy. We broke into an office, basically. So, <laughs> Truth, truth. And you can see everybody in the—I mean, you can't see everybody in the background, but you can see people that are signing up for some of the incredible giveaways oh, yeah. oh, that are yeah. here. They're just never-ending. They're giving away stuff over here. They're giving away stuff over there. Wines of people. Nuts. Tons of pro staff, not just on the bass, or not just on the uh, uh, crappie magnet and the B and M pro staff, but just everybody in the industry just kind of flocks here to share the knowledge. One thing that I've noticed, I've been working with the crappie magnet booth and then uh, the B and M booth, but uh, the one thing from the last show I did here at Grizzly is we've seen a lot of single live scope poles going out of the store. Yeah. It's changed. We're seeing a lot more guys buying six or eight rods of the same one. So it looks like spider rigging, long lining, lining some of that stuff's coming yeah, back. And we're I, seeing that today on the floor. You know, I think that uh, maybe the newness of that, it, yeah, and, they're, yeah. it, and I think people are actually starting to utilize the new technology to improve their old fishing habits. Yep. Granted, everybody wanted to go catch that big one. And, and see their jig fall, but now they're thinking, they're forward thinking and say, hey, I used to catch a lot of fish spider rigging. I wonder if I catch more if I utilize, you know, the forward facing sonars. Well, and even, even me, like, of course I like dock shooting where I don't use the live scope as much, but when I'm fishing brush mm -hmm. piles, you know, when it first came out, I was like everybody up, my, my head was buried to the screen. Right. But now I'm using that live scope I'll, I'll pull up to a brush pile. I want to see if the fish are there. Yeah. And then I want to see, are they in the brush? Or around it, or what? And other than that, I, I go back to what I was doing: vertical jig and spider rigging. I'm not looking at the screen all the time. I just want to know if they're there to save me some time. But uh, yeah, I go back to the basics. And you know, Kirby, the one thing when that first came out, we did some shows on it. The response was incredible. Okay. Yeah. But then you got to figure we're doing a television show, and I and I've always said what sets our show apart from others is instead of you seeing me doing the same thing every week, we've got a different guest. And if you're my guest yeah. this week, this is your show. And we started getting some messages about, hey, you've kind of lost the interaction between you and the guest because both your heads are buried on that screen. Yes, you and know? I find that with the Fishy Live YouTube show, yes. it seems like we're you, you're getting a lot of the sponsors on your hat because your head's down <laughs> like that. So a lot of crappy magnet, a lot of B&M. Uh, people are seeing that on the screen. But I'm finding exactly like what you said, um, people are now going back to initially how they felt that thump. Yeah. Initially how they saw that line and they're using, they're still using the forward sonar, but basically to make certain that they're not fishing dead water. Yep. Because, you know, crappie, That's a, lot what of, I'm doing. a lot of crappie school. And when you get on a school on like my last episode of Fish Eat Live, it was 44 feet long mm. and it mm. was it was 18 foot wide. You have them days every day you tape, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a rarity. I, oh, I literally man. caught my limit in 20 casts. Nice. But what, what I found on that particular show, I couldn't utilize the live scope because there was my my whole screen was blacked out by yep. crappie. Now, granted, we're, we jest. That is a rarity. Uh. But uh, taking your eyes off the screen, um, knowing that they're there, you can actually get more intense because you know, you throw out, say you don't have forward facing sonar, don't have live scope. Remember the old days, 
you'd catch one, you made those mental notes. Mm -hmm. Hey, it was about four seconds when it hit the water before I had the bite. So that gives you that mental, you know, capacity of thinking, I've got to let that countdown happen. And and granted, I, I, I had that bite when I raised it up a little bit. Or I gave it a twitch, something to, you know, get their attention. Mm-hmm. And when you see it on the screen, uh, you only got to see it one time, and then you like that's what they want, and then you can hyper focus your senses. It, if to you produce. have a yeah, and if you have a live scope, and when you first start using it, or when you start using it, that's what you can do. You learn things. I learned a lot of things that I thought uh, I was doing right that I wasn't doing nearly right. And oh goodness, that's the big plus with it. But I want to talk about something else now. Okay. You and I yeah. have talked about doing a show. And if you haven't seen his show on YouTube, check that out. Great show. Fishy live on this big belly. There, there you, go. you go. Same thing as ours. Absolutely free for you. Just go to YouTube. But between your schedule and my schedule, Ugh. it's been hard for us to get together. It's been hard for us to get together here. I know. Because I know. there's so many people, and, and we just keep high-fiving. What about now? What about now? But We, we tried to get this video for yeah, all day today. Two days now we've been trying to get it. So, But let's, let's talk. I'd like you to talk about two different lakes in Kansas. Okay. We're going to talk about, uh, let's say, March fishing, okay? March fishing. If I'm going to Kansas, okay. two lakes. Luther. Come to the register, please, Luther. Luther, you're needed at the register. Come on, Luther. So give me two lakes. What are we going to do? We're going to do March, or or that's pre-spawn in Kansas. Let's do one March, and let's do one winter spawning. Okay. March is uh, a wonderful... Actually, March can be a little bit difficult for fishing in Kansas because these fish have come off their lethargic winter bite. Uh, They're starting to warm up, and you're having all sorts of crazy weather in Kansas, unfortunately, still in March. Um, So it can be a form of transition. And whenever crappie are staging from one area, whether it's spring, summer, winter, or fall, there's movement. Right. And when there's movement, they're not as concentrated as they are in the school, in my semi-professional opinion. So whenever there's movement, um, you have to uh, adjust to that. And a good way of adjusting to that is actually what what we're talking about, uh, multiple poles, Spider rigging is a good way uh, to do that in Kansas. Unfortunately, we have a three pole limit, so same here in I Ohio. I don't know what kind of insect has six legs. Would it be grasshopper <laughs> rigging? I don't know, but uh, um, that slow presentation because they're still lethargic. Um, uh, that is a good way to find staging fish, uh, and you want to think like a crappie. And, and to think like a crappie, I I'm a big bird hunter. I love to uh, hunt for quail and pheasant, Mm -hmm. and my favorite, of course, is quail. Um, I I shoot more pheasant because they're They're easier. easier, Easier. Quail are fast. But I always, uh, you know, equivalent crappie as the underwater quail bird. Because if you think about quail hunting, you have to have the right area where quail will flourish, not only in their eating habits, but their nesting habits, their breeding patterns, that sort of stuff. And if you think like that in your attempt to catch crappie, uh, you'll find the same way. If you look at most illustrations or on most live scope screens, you'll see that crappie stay on structure, not only to ambush you know, bait fish, but also <coughs> to stay protected from uh everything that's trying to eat crappie, mm-hmm. which is everything in the water. All them bigger fish. And, and including, you know, danger from above, not only us, but hawks and, and eagles and, and diving duck birds that yep. will uh, devastate a crappie lake. Um, so they have to have structure. And then you have to have basically a cropland, which is area that facilitates the growth of shad or you know bait fish. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need some type of um, structure or that that attracts that. Uh, and if you can find that magic combination, uh, then you're you're in the the money. So, but March they tend to go from one holding pattern, which is structure, to like thinking about hey you know. I'm, it's warming up a little bit. Uh, I might want to start thinking about spawning. My belly's getting full of eggs. Uh, and they start that movement pattern. And the males go first, uh, as we know, and, and they kind of go shallow. Mm-hmm. And, and they usually stage about anywhere from five to nine feet. And then the females usually go from about 18 to you know, 16, 14, that sort of thing. Uh, and then as the 
Uh, moon phases progress where there's a little bit more light in the air and uh, at night, and as they progress with you know warmer weather and warmer water, they start moving shallow. Gotcha. Uh, and so it's that transition phase in March where you have to try to intercept them. Uh, now, when the spawn's on, uh, which is you know after March, it usually comes late April, the first week or two in May. Uh, then they they get into an area where they concentrate again, with the males uh, creating areas for the females to come in. And well, actually, I don't know if you've ever seen the spawn, but it's it's a pretty violent act of nature. If you ever seen chickens uh, mate, uh, the males actually herd the big females and in large groups just bombard her and hit her and, and attack her until she actually expels her eggs. And then they do their business. Uh, and then the males stay around, usually a couple of big males to keep the other males or the, from eating the eggs. So it's a very, uh, we have some clear lakes that we can see that spawning thing. And it's a, it's a sight to see. Have you ever seen it? Have not. You have, have not. Yeah. No. In, in all your years. No. Nope. Yeah. Um, it, it, it. You know, you ought to go to Dale Hollow when the spawn on, because that that we'll lake is so. We'll be there so, this year during are you? the spawn. Yes. Hey, you lucky yes. dog. Try. I'll be there. Try to sneak up. You know what's funny is I got I got snookered at Dale Hollow. Um, looking down into the water at this last tournament and I'm like, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win this tournament. And uh, I saw him on the live scope and then I could see him in front of me in the water and I was watching their behavior. And then the first two casts, I'm like, ah, those are bluegill because I could <laughs> see the way that they moved. Yeah. And I, I had a thump and I missed it. <laughs> and I'm like, those are gotta be bluegill. If they're crappie, you know, they were big, like shell crackers. Shell crackers things. down there. And uh, finally I hooked one and, you know, I'm like, yeah, these are bluegill. And it took me two more to convince myself to move on. But it was a nest of bluegill on a ridge uh, and I could see them. And, you know, just getting a, a visual you know, window into mm -hmm. the underwater world really, um, really helps you think what's going on and 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 how to present to, yeah. to catch them. Um, so yeah, if you ever get a chance to you know witness the actual spawn, another good way of knowing when the spawn is actually on. Have you ever seen during the spawn just one or two crappie floating at the top of the water? Oh yeah, for no reason. Yeah, you know, not not that they've got a fish stuck in their mouth. But that is basically that crappie's cigarette. After they done, yeah, <laughs> they 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 literally run out of energy. They have their moments with their lady partner, and a lot of times they'll they'll lose kind of consciousness and float. I've had, how many times have you ever scooped a crappie off the water and think, hey, what's wrong with this thing? Yeah. You go to scoop it and it swims off, right? So if you ever see crappie floating on the top of the water when the when the absolute you know elements are all correct you've got that 60 degree weather you've got that moonlight that's happened for about two or three nights in a yeah. row um, because that's what actually uh, tells those females to go kind of like how deer hunters moon face is big yeah how the does get you know the does their eyes actually trigger their ovaries to go into the the rut in November, so um, yeah, but if you ever see those crappie floating, you better get out, it goes shallow, because you're gonna catch a lot. See, we're, we're lucky, in my home lake, and I think I've told you this, we're six foot all the way across. There are no ledges deep, not. What? It was hand dug in the 1800s. And it's only six foot? Six foot, it's a bowl. So anything that we fish, basically, are either rocks along the shoreline or people's docks or something. Wow. But there are a lot of times during the spawn where we will see their backs Oh, in the and shallows? We, we're talking a yeah. foot of water. And, oh, gosh. And then hang on. Because oh, yeah. you're hooking them, they got nowhere to go but out. It's it's a blast. Don't ever, ever <laughs> take for granted where a crappie can be. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I had, in one of these episodes, I got to go wading uh, with John Godwin in Arkansas. And we were literally shin deep. And we were catching crappie. And and giants, yeah, uh, you know, in it shin deep, this deep of water, and and uh, the host, uh, I don't know if he wants me to say his name because it was such a, a crappy <laughs> hot spot, but he said, uh, you, know, you guys be careful because this is the first warm day. There's going to be uh, 
snakes falling from the sky. And you I'm guys like, know me? Yeah. I'm out of there. And I'm like, snakes falling from the sky? What is it, Armageddon or something? And and he goes, no, they, you know, the them snakes will thaw out from being frozen, and uh, they'll fall from the skies as, as it gets warmer. Usually around 11 or noon, you'll start hearing them fall. And sure enough, man. Dude. Per splat. And nope. I, I look over. And it's a, and luckily it's still moving slow, so I had time to get out of the way. But and then, five minutes later, kersplat. Mm-mm. I mean, these stories that we get while we crappie fishing. No. And sure enough, man, snakes are falling out of the trees that they've been hibernating the one oh. day that we're crappie fishing. I mean, I must have counted 15, 20 snakes falling out of the sky. Fans, you've heard me talk about snakes. All through the years, you know that's not yeah. happening for yeah. me. <laughs> William Oliver, if you're watching this, you know William Oliver down in Texas one uh-huh. time. We were going to do first show. And uh, he called me the night before we were getting ready to travel. And he said, Russ, he said, it is incredible right now, the bite. He says, and you can have your choice. He said, we can do a waiting show uh-huh. or we can go hit some some brush piles. And I said, dude, I'm all about waiting. Let's do it. He says, okay. Uh-huh. He said, listen, Russ, he said, I know how you are. He said, you will have to hit some snakes away with your rod tip. I said, boat sounds great to me. Oh. And we did the boat show. <laughs> so, well, let uh, me ask you. So, yeah. we're, we're, by the time this is going to air, okay. we're going to be in your spawn, probably early spawn. You're guiding, and someone wants to come to Kansas. They want to give you, get a trip with you. If you have your choice, conditions are right, what lake are you going to take? Okay, um, well, I know you fished with Joe Bragg, yes. and he is a very talented guy. That was an amazing... Yeah, and that was at Milford Lake. It was awesome. Um, it is a giant <laughs> reservoir in comparison to a lot of the lakes uh, in Kansas. Um, I mean, we don't have those 90 miles like you have in Eufaula, mm-hmm. Oklahoma, or Kentucky Lake. Uh, they're basically potholes compared to those lakes. But uh, it's an incredible reservoir for blue cat, walleye, and crappie. And the crappie numbers there are outlandish. And so, I can attest to that. So much so uh, that the limit is 50. Mm. You ever heard of a lake where the limit's no, 50? And, no. they're, and they're big people. So Milford Lake, a great place. It's uh, it's kind of on the border of, uh, like around Manhattan, Kansas, about two and a half, three hours from the Kansas City area, northwest. And, and if you want to see some on Milford, check out the show that we aired. Mm. It would be the first Monday in February. Go to YouTube. Yeah. And that shows on it. That was a late fall show, yeah. but you can still see what we did. And Joe Bragg, an incredible Kansas guide, um, you know. Uh, and veteran. And veteran, absolutely. Uh, and you can get a hold of him. Uh, he has uh, a lot of social media presence uh, in Kansas and, and does a wonderful job putting in you on slabs. So, And I saw this is a good show, man. <laughs> so so when you're when you're fishing the mm-hmm. spawn there, what's your favorite technique? What equipment are you using? Uh, well, uh, not just to blow smoke up you, but uh, my favorite rod is the Sharpshooter Six. Okay. I feel that's not a bad rod. Yeah, I feel that that's uh, one of the uh, great utility rods. It's a single piece graphite that BNM produces, and it has tremendous sensitivity. And what I like to do is throw the underspin baits, whether it's a Roadrunner, my particular favorite, a fin spin. Uh, I think they got the colors nailed down. The fin spin pro. You can also buy the heads blank and put your mm. favorite curly tail on there. But throwing that out there parallel to the bank in the particular depth. Uh, and just working that so slow uh, with the rod tip up so that it's kind of in the middle Mm -hmm. of the water column so that these males and these females that are trying to do their business, you know, underneath them can see it with their biological, you know, makeup with their eyes on top, crappie predominantly, Mm -hmm. you know, feed upwards. You know, every now and then you'll catch one uh, in the bottom of the lip where they're going down. Right. Um, and just slow rolling that, you know, casting out maybe 25, 35 yards and just feeling that thump. That's, that's what we live for, am I right? And casting is one of those arts that's kind of lost. And uh, mm. when you get back to the basics like that, making them cast, you'll have a blast. I love that style. Oh, and, yeah. you know, like there, there's, there's two techniques, and depending on the bite, if you've got the rod tip, a lot of people like that line, if they're doing a steady retrieve, to be as straight as can be as it goes into the water. Yeah. I do a little bit different. So I've got the tip of my rod. I'll have like a loop 
laying okay. on there. And the reason being is on that loop, if I got that high vis line on, I'm reeling, and every once in a while, I'll either stop it or just pop it a little bit. To get there with attention. that loop, you will see that line jump so much easier. It whips. It oh, dude, yeah. it's like lightning hits yeah. it. So, and it's what you prefer, what you've been used to, but. Casting is such a great time, crappie fishing. And like you say, during the spawn, if you ever want to do it again, that's it, man. Yeah. And then, you know, the, another, you know, similar uh, approach is just a simple bobber with either a minnow underneath it or your favorite color jig or even an underspin retrieving it very slow. You yeah. know, that is also a very deadly uh, technique. So, and when you're going for them spawning fish, crappie magnet makes a couple size corks. Get the pan fish. It matches up well with a 132nd eye hole or a 132nd double cross. It is the absolute most deadly combination you're going to use in the spring when you're cork fishing with the Russ Bailey signature rod or something. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, hey, you, hey. Well, you, you got to have a longer rod, um, um, you know, for the to adjust the depths on the cork. Yeah, so yeah, uh, you yeah. need that Russ Bailey. And and uh, you, how what size? You got a, in a ten foot and a ten and a half and a eight. Yeah, and it, a big fan of that rod as well. It, and you know, sorry, I blew the answer. No, earlier. that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. Um, all kidding aside. You know, our shows, you know, between all the social media sites that we're on and YouTube and everything, yeah. we've got stats and everything, and uh, it still blows my mind. All that right. we, somebody is looking on. for their keys. I've got them up here at the front office for a forward. A set of keys for a forward. I got mine. What about you? Yeah, I got mine. Okay. <laughs> so you can tell we are at the Grizzly Show, but yeah. all joking aside... You know, we do all these different techniques and everything, but every time we have a jig and bobber show, the numbers are higher oh. than any other shows. We And it's because everybody started out that way. Yeah, and, and plus, you know, the excitement of that bobber go down and oh, the mystery yeah. of what's on the other end is just, it's, uh, I don't know if there's any other thrill like it. It could be a... Tiny little bluegill. It could be a world record crappie, or it could be a twelve pound channel it, cat. It never gets old, especially. It's like Christmas. What do we get, dude? And if it's <laughs> if it's an aggressive bite where the cork's there, and then yeah. a second later, it's just it's gone. It's yeah. nothing like it. Yeah, and you know the neat thing about it is you can dissect any of these presentations, whether it's cork fishing or casting or spider rigging or all these things that we've been speaking about, you can dissect it down to the most minute detail. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these pros here at the Grizzly Jig Show, which happens the first weekend before Super Bowl in February, they do that. And boy, there's standing room only. I, I sat in for a little bit on your seminar and, and a lot of the other pros, you know, just learning these little tidbits that, you know, if you think you know it all on crappie fishing, you're crazy. It's a it's a crazy moving, unsolvable puzzle. I, I'm telling you what, and I and I talk about this on almost every seminar. I've been doing this for over thirty something years now. And the thing that keeps this great for me is every time, and I'm talking every single time I go tape with someone after all this time, I still learn something yeah. every time I go out. And and that just makes it great for me. Yeah, it's funny when people say, oh, you're a crappie pro. And I'm like, man, I'm not a crappie pro. I don't think there is such a thing. I, mm. I'm a crappie enthusiast for sure. And Well, uh, Caps and Coleman, you guys probably are crappie pros. They, those boys are pros. <laughs> Yeah. You probably get it. I got some stories, and I know uh -huh. you do too on those guys, but uh, the yeah, eight-time national champs and two of the nicest, most giving individuals back to the sport in the way that they not only conduct themselves but also promote the sport, and, and they've been here every day. Well, Steve I, Coleman's a workhorse. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, you know, we talk about how many years I've done this stuff, and we used to do a lot of shows on tournaments, and – uh I can honestly say this, and this is not up for debate. Caps and Coleman, they are the best crappie team that has ever been assembled. Absolutely. I mean, they just simply are. Even individually, they're yeah. phenomenal. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, Ronnie, he won tournaments with his wife. I mean, that when, when we used to take, <laughs> you can't the, really beat that. When we did the tournaments, yeah. you know, we would see their boat, and we definitely want to follow them for a little bit. Yeah, but we would watch when they would pull up to a spot. 
One guy's doing one thing, one guy's doing the other, and it is a fine oiled machine. And when they decide they're moving, <clears throat> it's two seconds stuff is put away, and they're on their way, man. Oh, yeah. It was great. You know, what's funny is I've had the honor of fishing with Kent Driscoll uh, in some tournaments. And, and there we go to the other end of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you said that, but yes, he, he's the other end, but pretty pretty same plateau when it comes to knowledge with Kent Driscoll. But, uh, you know, I think we fish these tournaments for different reasons. Those boys want to finish in the top 10 and we want to finish to get to the beer at the end of the day. Uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, I always, like I said, I've had honor fishing against Caps and Coleman in a few tournaments. I mean, I've only fished like three or four. With them. Uh, I, I'm, I love to guide as yeah, well. Yeah. And, and then doing these shows uh, is pretty time consuming. It is. So, it is. Uh, um, but the few tournaments that I've fished with them, I always stick around to hear what they said. And and when you hear <clears throat> Ronnie Cap say something like the likes of, well, we followed one fish probably too long today. It might have hurt us. I mean, we stayed on this fish for two and a half to three hours, but we finally caught it. And I'm like... I and, mean, that's and, that's... and they would do stuff like that before live scope, too. Yes, they would. They knew they were just like Use, say the machine. Yeah, they're a machine, but anyway, hey man, well, folks, listen, we're we, going to we, wrap it how up. How long could we talk? The, the, we can keep vision going. Yeah. all day. Yeah, but you've got to be somewhere. I got to be somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Baseball guys, I will be back for practice tomorrow, so get ready. You're not getting the day off. Yeah. But all joking aside, Kirby, it's always good oh, talking to yeah, you, man. Yeah. We will be getting the show with Kirby this spring. I promise spring. you. And I will be getting a fishy live show with him as well. So yep. uh, we'll just have two camera crews. We can do that. So. But thank you for all you do. And, thank and it's you. an honor to be around you. Appreciate and, it, brother. And learn. And thank you for being an inspiration. So Appreciate it, thank brother. Thank you, man. Folks, before we take off, I'd like to remind you, if you don't have the Brush Pile Fishing app, please download, download that on your phone. Completely free. It doesn't matter if it's Android or an Apple phone. It's got a lot of great features. The first thing that you'll see is all of our shows are at your fingertips, completely free to watch. And we always list the newest show first. Yeah. Um, the other thing, my favorite feature of it is I used to keep handwritten logs every day I went fishing. Uh -huh. Everything's right there. Put the notes in there that you want, the colors you use, the water temperature, everything. You always have that with you. And then also, when Kirby and I will do this show, we're going to add Kirby to our guide section. Say you see that show, you think, man, I'd like to fish with him. Yeah. Go to our guide section, look up Kirby. It'll give you a bio on him. If you want to book a trip, you can either email or call right through the app straight to this man. Ooh. So it's a great app. Check it out. And folks. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Stay tuned because we'll be back with another one. Thanks for joining us on Brush Pile Fishing, the podcast.